Welcome back to the Mandarin Blueprint Podcast. We're back here with Keith Travis, who has kindly agreed to continue the discussion about his uh, going through the Mandarin Blueprint method at a speed that we really haven't seen before. And it's fascinating. It's really cool to see because we like to, um, you know, Keith, you remind me of sometimes like people who I run across online who have kind of broken sort of our perceptions on how quickly you could do something or, you know, how much you could handle like these ultra marathon runners or something where it was like, we thought we could only run, you know, 26 miles at most. And then these people are running <laughs> hundreds of miles and you're like, wow. Um, and so you've gone through our course so quickly that I um, want to give people, other people out there, the idea that, hey, you know, maybe some of the sense that you can only go so fast is self-imposed. You know, maybe there's uh, you could, go quicker if you use some of Keith's techniques and, you know, that type of thing. So, but also before we get to that though, your previous conversation with Luke, actually it got cut off because of a uh, recording error. And so I was wondering if we could first just sort of talk a little bit about what you talked about with Luke in that unrecorded section, which I believe was just some general thoughts about the course. So uh, perhaps you could start with that. I'll start with that. Uh, the, the one thing we actually, we actually got cut off once and then we we tried again and we forgot to record, but the one thing that I said both times was an analogy to uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. I said, it doesn't really matter in, in, in which order light hits the telescope. It doesn't matter, photon for photon. You know, it, you, you exposed it out to a region of space long enough, you're gonna get the same picture regardless because you've got this stream of light coming in. And I was just saying with the Mandarin Blueprint, you know, it's nice, a person can approach it. They don't, you know, you, you mentioned early in the course that you set it up to be rather linear, but I think also rather early on, a person can start uh, heading in one direction with it or another. They can prefer sentences or try to speak or try to write. And regardless, you know, of the order in which they do start doing things at that point, they hold the exposure open and the engagement open long enough to each factor, you're going to get the same view of the language and the competency, you know, uh, in the end. Yeah, and just to comment on that, I feel very similarly because, you know, I spend a lot of time currently in the process of, of building up the advanced course. And, uh, you know, especially when I get to the advanced course, it's very clear to me that it's like, you know, what's most important here is learning the character, but like anything that we branch off from there is kind of like, mm -hmm. these are things that you will eventually see no matter what. You just want to make sure that you have the basic thing, the character set in place. And there is actually a point in the course, probably around the time the intermediate course is finished, where it goes from, you know, being important that you kind of get some general sense of grammar structures in the language and seeing lots of sentences to going back to being characters are the most important thing, because then you give yourself the tools to open up anything in the language, any article, any podcast in Chinese, any uh, TV show with subtitles and uh, with Chinese subtitles, and you can just watch it and get good comprehensible input. So there's sort of these, these different branches. But in the end, I always remind myself when I'm starting to get a little bit like, oh, should it be this order or that order? I remind myself, well, wait, in the end, you do need to just sort of learn all of it. So it's not the, of most importance whether or not this is character 2,500 or 2,700. You know, that's the more important thing is just that it all gets in there at some point. So that's a good analogy. I like that. Pretty cool. Okay. Uh, I think depending on how a person approaches it, uh, some challenges that might have been harder get easier, or some that might have been easier get harder. Mm. Uh, I, I realized, you know, in some cases, some of the sentences were, were rather easy. Mm -hmm. uh, reading them on the website and then doing a closed deletion was difficult. But then I also realized again, I was focusing on characters. And I was really paying almost no attention to uh, what I've learned are called bigrams. Is that right? Two, two character words. Two character words. I'd never called them bigrams before, but sure, that may be a linguistic term I'm, for them. But most I'm words are two that, characters, yeah. I'm seeing that reference more consistently on, online. Bi, tri, and quadrigrams. And a lot of the idioms are, are quadrigrams, four character phrases. That's right, yeah. Okay. So, you know, I'm seeing that and I realize, wow, these sentences are still hard. Uh, but that's also because I haven't been learning any of these <laughs> bigrams. Mm -hmm. And then, but getting such a strong initial feel for the characters, I switched off from the sentences and boom, I'm able to soak up those bigrams and then boom, the sentences are appropriate again. So, you know, it takes a little shuffling around sometimes to realize 
you know, in that case, sometimes doing some things more linearly does make a lot of sense, certainly. Uh, and how you just kind of, you know, yeah, to, to or through. I think it's good, you know, if, if, you're, if something is too challenging, if you think, well, this is one plus challenge level, you know, maybe it's actually like one plus plus. Mm -hmm. uh, just because it's harder than you, <laughs> it doesn't mean it's at the right level of challenge. And if it's right. if it's right. barely comprehensible, it's, it's probably a little bit too much. And there's probably some other in between stuff that you can take to really open it up. Yeah. Uh, so I I uh, took the HSK four. I'll mention that, and I got mm -hmm. I got my guaranteed HSK four pass out of it. And you know I'll say I didn't even finish half of the required biogram vocabulary you know i'd barely mm. spend any time just giving myself an initial exposure to it and already you know things were were very sufficient for reading and writing again on the listening section i i analyzed one test before i took one and what i found on the listening was that uh i would have the page translated into english on my web browser mm -hmm. and i would listen to the native audio and being able just to read the questions that, that were to follow each of the speaking uh, parts of the, of the test, knowing that question solidly in English first made it so that I only had to hear five to 10% of what was going on in the audio. If someone was saying, you know, one of the questions was like, are these sisters different? Mm -hmm. Or the, you know, and so I'm hearing like, you know, uh, Bui Young. And it doesn't matter what else is happening in the sentence. I've got a huge clue. No, they're not the same. You know, they are, they are different. Right. So it's interesting. A person can still pass those tests. And it brings me around to this sense of, have you heard of the, the Chinese room argument or the Turing test? Uh, I've heard of the Turing test. Okay. Well, both of these are relevant. The, the Turing test, people who may not know, is, is the idea of uh, distinguishing between a, a live person that you, know, you may be engaging or speaking with versus let's say like a computer algorithm. There are a lot of computer algorithm personalities. They're kind of fun, you know, they're difficult to find sometimes, but you, know, you, can, you can find them online. They're kind of you know, early models uh, of what it would be like to have an artificial personality. And you can speak to them and write them sentences, rather you can write them sentences. And yeah, they'll even do voice to text. And the, the algorithm will respond to you. And very often it's very sensible. At some point though, you realize that you can start to engage it in a way where you realize it is a computer program. It's mm -hmm. not behaving very human-like. Uh, similarly with Google Translate, it has an algorithm, you know, it creates more or less grammatically correct structures, but sometimes I guess I'm not, you know, maybe it doesn't, but a native can certainly tell, you know, is that you or is that Google Translate? Yeah. Uh, and then the Chinese room argument is one where you're, you're on one side of a wall, someone is on the other side, and there's a little slot. You have a list of sentences. You can't read them. You can't read them at all. They're in, let's say they're in Chinese. Let's say they're in Mandarin. You can't read them yet. But they're numbered like one through ten. <clears throat> And then in another column, you have another set of sentences, which are response sentences. If someone hands you a slip of paper through the door, you match it up on the left column to see which sentence it, it lines up with. And then you go over to the right column and you, you write that sentence out, you hand it back. And the person on the other side of the door, well, they, they, had a, they would have a tough time knowing, was this an actual response you know, mm -hmm. from a knowing person? To, to the slip of paper, what, what was written on it? Or is this, you know, is someone, is something responding to me without having really any, any, any sentience or any clue of what it's mm -hmm. saying to me in response? So those ideas are kind of an in-between, I think, from being at a very beginning level to what real fluency is like. And that's what I'm focusing on now is, you know, the idea of, of, of getting to the, that sort of Chinese room argument or that Turing test, at what point would I be able to pass the Turing test? Hmm. At what point am I doing more than simply a Chinese room, you know, kind of exchange and, and expressing myself more uh, authentically and improvisationally? Uh, and, you know, even if I'm not able to, you know, if I just get anywhere close to just being able to be formally appropriate, 
uh, I'd say that's a big win. Mm -hmm. uh, getting getting to that definite step where I'm at least as good as Google Translate. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that's a big win. Uh, yeah. I wrote in a comment, you know, if Google Translate can understand me. I bet that uh, a native speaker would be able to, you know, would have a good chance of understanding me as well, even if my grammar is lacking. On the flip side of that, of course, then are listening skills. And really, I don't have much plan beyond uh, picking back up pretty heavy duty with uh, Mandarin Blueprint sentences and the mm -hmm. passages. I am, I am kind of conducting a side experiment uh, of my own. I've spent most of the last week actually heavily into spreadsheets and Anki, learning how to leverage those things and kind of tailor them to, to my deficiencies. Uh, so, you know, this, this is all about uh, developing these listening skills then, this month too. I can say lots of things crudely, but I can say lots of things yeah. <laughs> now, <laughs> and that's good. But I think that, you know, working on being able to under, you know, but, uh, setting the stage for more and more things being comprehensible input right now, yeah. that's, that's a huge goal. Uh, and I've got a whole month to do that before even thinking about the HSK-5. And I think I'm going to probably adopt the sort of mm, your philosophy with we're not as, as, as passing a test is a successful byproduct, a side effect of learning the language. You know, I am including making sure that I'm aware of what vocabularies is that I need beyond what I have for HSK-5. And, and I've, I've made a deck just for that. But I'm also, you know, realize that the biogram vocabulary on the Mandarin Blueprint also far exceeds the HSK-5. And I'm in a prime position now to learn that because I know all of the characters for all of your biogram vocabulary. So I need, mm -hmm. uh, I need to take advantage of that and shoot well beyond the HSK-5, you know, minimum requirements. It's much better use of my time. Uh, the tests are fun, you know, they're, they're neat, you can learn from them, they're a good challenge, and they're comprehensible input in their own right, uh, but I think it's definitely wise to like, yeah, shoot, shoot past it, um, much better use of time. So uh, there's other things going on, Phil, but I, 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 my train is ended for the moment. Maybe you could comment and, uh, and another prompt will emerge. Sure, sure. Uh, so, well, I mean, regarding the HSK tests and, you know, how that, uh, you know, how the, well, like, one of the things you mentioned was that, you know, you hear the buiyang at the end of a sentence, and because you have the sense of the, uh, the English there, you therefore, the, the question in English, and therefore, you know, okay, it's probably going to be something to do with, uh, you know, difference, and so is the, are the sisters different buiyang, you know, it's, different even though you might not have understood all the things previously and there's kind of another thing that starts to happen as you read longer bits of text with the which the higher level hsks will have you read long bits of text in fact the hsk6 uh well the former hsk6 uh was one of the big tasks at the end was to read a thousand word article you have 10 minutes to read it and then you have 35 minutes to summarize it in 400 characters so a thousand character article summarized in 400 characters and, um, you know, 10 minutes is, uh, you know, the idea is that you should try to read it three times if possible. Like, so that's like, you know, wow. three and a half, yeah, three minutes. And, you know, I mean, that's the, the test. That's 300 right. words a minute. So yeah. So, yeah. And so the, towards the end, of course. Yeah, exactly. And so that, that's the test prep, you know, people, they say you should probably get through it three times and get your main points figured out that way. And one of the things that happens there is that, you know, the other thing the HSK test will do at the advanced level is that they have a word list, yeah, but they still put in words that aren't on the word list uh, because mm -hmm. they expect you to be able to figure things out contextually, even if you don't know specifically or you haven't studied that word specifically. But the thing is, you really can do it because, uh, you know, as you build up more of your you know, base understanding through the various compound words that you know, and mostly the characters, I would say, then you start to have, you know, so for example, if I'm reading any given page of say, like the Chinese translation of Harry Potter, there'll be a bunch of words in it that aren't on the HSK tests uh, at all, but all the characters I know, and all the characters are from the HSK, 
And so you've got both the characters and the context of the page and the paragraph and the chapter and what's going on in the story to help you figure out what that word is. Now, occasionally you run into a word that's like a, uh, a two character word where both characters are very rare and therefore I might not even know the two characters. That still doesn't mean I don't know the meaning of the paragraph or the meaning of the sentence because you can still figure it out through context there. And so this is all just to say that uh, as you're building up your kind of points of understanding, you have this meta thing that's happening, which maybe you could call passing the Turing test or whatever, you know, like sort of getting to the point where your understanding is such that you don't even need to learn at the granule level to be able to learn granular, granular things, if that makes sense. So um, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, but that's that's. Actually, I wrote some notes here, and I've got I've got four good comments now in, in response to what you're saying. Uh, briefly on the HSK four, so yeah, having analyzed it once and read the English question version of what what question would follow, they they would read a bit and then they would ask a question in, in Mandarin. Well, I read that question in Mandarin from the get go, and it's available to read in Mandarin from the get go. So right. if a person is a strong reader. Mm -hmm. When they get to the listening section, then they just need to, from a test taking point of view, fixate first thing, uh, you know, and translate that question prompt and they'll get, you know, the rest of one and then a second chance to, to listen for any, any big word clues. <laughs> so that really yeah. makes that a lot easier from a test taking point of view. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think the same probably applies, you know, the reading part to to making like movies and shows more comprehensible. If they have subtitles there and you're a strong reader, mm -hmm. you still can't hear what's going on. But if you can read it and then listen for it a little bit, you know, read it a little. And that's a challenge. Reading it a little bit faster than they're speaking it. Sometimes. Yeah. But whole, oh, yeah. At least the whole sentence, the whole subtitle will come up at once. So that's a really interesting way. There are all kind of ways to make things a bit more comprehensible or at least try to leverage your strengths in mm -hmm. some way you know to set yourself up for for engaging a weakness a little bit more okay so that mm -hmm. was one comment another small comment is metronomes you know you mentioned you've got a thousand characters to read in 10 minutes that's 100 characters per minute 300 per minute on average if you're reading it three times and you know uh, i think i saw somewhere on a, on a on a breakdown around 130 characters per minute reading speed was generally recommended Mm -hmm. uh, at, at those levels. And if you take a metronome, you can get one for free, you know, on your phone and, sure. and actually see how fast 130 beats per minute is. It's not really that bad. Yeah, it's not really that bad. Like, yeah. Right around there. So yeah. yeah. Right around there. So I think maybe some people, or at least myself, maybe trying to read faster than that, actually. And that yeah. they might need to slow down and smooth out. Mm -hmm. Or do do something to kind of help with that and, and take away the, the impulsivity. In, in the well, and also, if you were to just read like a sentence and you see the sentence, like sometimes, you know, as you gather your ability to read Chinese, I mean, I'm starting to get to the point where I think that I might be able to read Chinese faster than English, cause, but I was never that fast of an English reader to begin with, so it's not that impressive. But like, uh, you <laughs> might read a sentence like, because you get it all very quickly. So the idea yeah. of 300 beats per minute, you know, obviously sounds really if it's perfectly even but you might it might be more like you know like 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 something like that type of thing in terms of how quickly you're actually comprehending it uh because you start right. to spot patterns even in the sentence level you know so right well i'm curious phil you know when you say maybe read a little bit faster in mandarin i wonder when i try to when i read when i read not try to read when i read mandarin now uh I can still read it pretty fast so long as I don't attempt to read it out loud or, or oh, to right, yeah. sub vocalize it or pronounce mm -hmm. anything or even consider how to pronounce it. Right. And that is very interesting. That is a very interesting uh, benefit from the language. And that's kind of what's happening. You've got all these dialects uh, and even distinct languages referring to the same written language. Mm -hmm. Sure. It has meaning apart from how you pronounce it. You don't have to link pronunciation to it. So that's very interesting. And I think that's good. Trying, trying, you know, getting the whole set of things though and trying to read things out loud is a separate skill from just reading. It's oh, a very yeah. interesting. 
so uh so yeah that was um one two two more two more things to comment on uh mm -hmm. so you're talking about uh sometimes you don't know what words are at all maybe it's two fairly rare characters that are forming a bigram mm -hmm. and you don't need to know what they are but what what i've been discovering is i've been compiling lists of vocab from classical modern etc sources is that uh it's neat i don't maybe i don't want to know how to say technetium <laughs> or the or the, the the you know or the you know sometimes the translation is like the uh linnaean and a taxonomic two-part name in, in roman lettering for a species of plant or animal and maybe i i don't Maybe I don't, that's not what I'm learning. If I look up a picture of whatever that is and I see, oh, that's a certain kind of flower with yellow petals. Okay, great, fine. I'm not saying that giant name in Mandarin. I'm saying mm -hmm. that, that yellow petal flower thing. And, right. and even if I don't know what that means, what, what I'd like though is to have a sense of, uh, like in English, you know, I come across technetium. I really don't know what it is. I'm pretty sure it's like a material maybe even an element mm -hmm. on the periodic table. If mm -hmm. I see, you know, I see another word, I think it was, I don't remember what it was. It was like marmoset or something like that. I'm like, I'm not sure what that is. I think it's a furry critter right. of some kind. <laughs> yeah. And so I think being able to get to the point where it, at least even if you can't pronounce a character or even if you've never seen it before, if you have enough familiarity and you're like, I don't know what that is or how to say it exactly, but I think that may be a furry critter of some kind. I right. think that may be, maybe that's like a material of some mm -hmm. kind or, yeah. So I think, you know, that's seeing, sensing that kind of thing is, is good. Uh, and this brings me to my fourth prompt, uh, shopping for words, mm -hmm. which I think at the point, you know, when a person has, has gotten like a serious fix on at least, you know, like on the intermediate vocab, up to that point and they've got a, a pretty strong fix on enough characters you don't need to focus on the hsk characters they are high frequency you know uh characters all things considered still in the language mm -hmm. but also you can start to go shopping for words right. at this point i think you can go shopping for words and it's a lot of fun you know mm -hmm. to go shopping for words and I, I think that you can you can do that and still apply the hands and method and even Maybe even, you know, gather a set of words that you went shopping for and then come come back and write them down or whatever. And the Anki is so very powerful, I think, even without OCLO, because you're now shopping for words and that's meaningful for you. You know, mm -hmm. there are so many characters or biograms I come across and I instantly remember what they are because I just feel very cool about that. I want to know how to say television. <laughs> you yeah. know and yeah. so yeah. i just remember that one no problem later mm -hmm. on you know it's familiar because i'm like oh yeah that's the word for television what was that again? Mm -hmm. and it just sounds right without even without a hamza method so i think that there can be some really strong potential there you know when, when it comes to really starting to branch out and uh, and and right. sort of make it your own well it's the emotion of it right so like the yeah. it's hard yeah. to come up with an emotional connection to a Chinese word using Chinese unless you have a bit of a foundation. But once you, you know, so hence why we focus so much on the emotional side of uh, the hence the movie method in the early part, because then you're gathering from your actual, your past experiences, which you never need to stop doing, but eventually you reach a point where it's like, okay, I'm talking to say, so I'm talking to someone in Chinese or I'm texting with someone in Chinese. And, you know, this happens to me all the time with like, I'm booking gigs for my band. And so I have a lot of vocabulary for, uh, things that relate to, uh, you know, sound systems and where are we going to set up our instruments and, you know, uh, how many, um, what combination of people do we want to have? Uh, do we want to have a four person combination without the singer or whatever? So there's all these things that I have to say all the time. And then, and uh, then there's a lot of Mandarin blueprint stuff too, that I'll be talking to our assistant and, you know, he'll, I'll say, can you do this? And it's kind of complicated and he'll respond with the better vocabulary than what I use to explain. But then because I'm really in that state of thinking about it, the word, I capture the word from the, 
uh, emotional context. And then, you know, even more so if you really right. want to know the right way to say something in a moment, because, you know, it's what uh, is going to make, you know, a deal go through or, you know, the, the, Situ the event that you're planning go more smoothly, then that word, the reason you remember it isn't because you built up from the bottom up, building the Hanza, using the Hanza movie method and then combining it with the other characters, you know, and then putting it into a sentence that's comprehensible, although that works, it's like, it's just because the situation called for it and you had enough of a foundation to understand it. And it's like, there's no objective point where that happens. It actually can start to happen quite early, but there's a, certainly a point where you, it happens more often than the other way, you know, so uh, exactly when that occurs. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I should, it's funny, I should remind myself of that because I have this thing, it's like, I guess it's a bit of perfectionism in my personality where because the Mandarin blueprint method is not quote unquote finished in terms of like what the advanced course will be and whatever, I sometimes am like, when people buy it, I'm like, oh, I don't know, it, it, I should we really charge this much because it's not finished yet. So it's not, you know, it's not, perfect and like it's not to the point so maybe we should you know lower the price until we get it completely finished and then i'm like you know but on the other hand what everything i just said we certainly get you to the point where you are able to make those you know connections so anyway that's no i mean that's wonderful phil and i think luke used the term rejiggering you know it's business and you've got to figure out how to rejigger these things and a scene from batman uh, uh, the one that had the Heath Ledger as Joker, you know, he says, if you're good at something, don't do it for free. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I think it's very reasonable. You're experimenting with it, you know, you're building a business and, you know, uh, sure, you're changing some things around, but, uh, you know, a person has that free trial. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. I would say this to you. A person has that free trial. They see what they can get from that free trial. Mm hmm and they want to pay the price that, that you put on it for the rest, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're satisfied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Besides, and, we'll you know, we'll it can be a trick, it. It can be a <laughs> trick <laughs> things shift around a little bit later, but there are specials and there are this and there are that. And the main thing is that's the deal that I saw and I was satisfied with it. And that's yeah. that's what I have to bring to the table. like, I, I, I didn't wait for the 30 day trial to end. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, I got on that what do you call bandwagon? I got on that bandwagon, you know. Um, you sure did, yeah. Two yeah. <laughs> weeks. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's the, so yeah, I, I, the, you know, obviously, the, and I'm, that's obviously what I really think. It's just sort of like, you know, you have that, that thought in your head that just goes like, but you're, you know, my point, my ultimate point just being that when you have that uh, sort of foundational knowledge of the language, you know, the mm -hmm. points of potential, you know, triggering of what you already know and then connection to what you already know can come from the language itself. It doesn't have to only come from, you know, uh, art you know I, I say artificial, they're real in a way, but like artificial connections you're making to past experiences. So you go, okay, I'm gonna remember this character because of that thing my cousin did when I was 10, which is great, but it's like then eventually when you have enough of those um, sort of nodes in your network of Chinese right. understanding, then the possible connections are all over the place, which is pretty cool. Absolutely. You know, they, they keep just, they just keep branching out. Uh, mm -hmm. I, th I think what you guys have done that's just really amazing is that, you know, this language is uh, impenetrable rocky soil. And, you know, you, you scratch it long enough with just about any method, maybe for a year or five years <laughs> for long, eventually you might be able to recondition that soil and then finally plant a seed. But you guys mm -hmm. made it for me to the point that, oh my gosh, I broke ground <laughs> you know, like on day one, day yeah. two, and yeah. I was able to plant that seed, and I knew it. And that that's that's what you did. You didn't you didn't sure you you didn't you didn't uh, do everything, but yeah. you put it in the palm you put it in the palm of your hand and said, mm -hmm. all you have to do is reach for it. Uh, yeah. And I see that after you put soil, you know, and and, uh, and that's great. Uh, Sure, you know, I think there's a lot of things that you guys are setting in place that that you can continue to leverage beyond beyond the approach that you've already laid mm -hmm. out. I like to think of, of what you have so far as being this amazing way of, of literally and figuratively a groundbreaking method 
Uh, and then once, once, you know, there's another stage, you know, once the seed is planted and you've given it some water and it started to sprout, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe there are some ways to then start leveraging from where a person is at. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, I, I'm really curious to see where you're going to take your uh, advanced intermediate and advanced course. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really curious to see what you might think of uh, alongside, I'm going to say it like this, I'm going to assume maybe alongside, you know, continuing to expand the vocabulary, maybe the, the graded reading, uh, mm -hmm. the OCLO, the optimized character learning order selections, uh, because those things in and of themselves are excellent and very mm -hmm. worthwhile. I think you can continue to find ways to leverage though what a person has already established. You mm -hmm. know, first you're leveraging Hansa movie method, and that's great. And then once you use Hansa movie method to establish a prop, a character and a scene in, in so to speak, every location, more or less, then mm -hmm. you can leverage that in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah, I, like, I get really yeah. excited about the prospect of having um, trained tutors who understand exactly where a person is and then can mm -hmm. have conversations with them at that point. You know, that's a big project to set that type of thing up. But, you know, it's one of the things that after we have uh, our foundation um, of the course completely mapped out and, you know, at least the character order is totally published, uh, then, you know, the idea of having these points in the course where we can say to a, you know, a Chinese teacher, okay, you understand exactly what their vocabulary is. You kind of know what topics they should be able to handle. Mm -hmm. And then you get engaged in conversation. That could be really fun for activation for people getting a chance to activate. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, especially if we can manage to get uh, teachers who really get how the system works, which they're out there, you know, we would definitely be able to find uh, people who would understand that. And so, you know, that's an exciting prospect. And then of course, in the advanced course, one of the things I've been thinking about is that we probably we're, are going to write the graded readers first. So we'll say, okay, before we wor even worry about one sentence per usage of every uh, word, which you know we eventually we'll definitely have. The first thing we're going to do is try to use all of the vocabulary in articles of you know maybe three articles per level or something, and then we extract those sentences from the articles and apply them to the different words. And then we just fill in the blanks if there were any usages that didn't get used in the articles. Because the more important thing once you get to the advanced course is that you get lots of exposure to content uh, at that's bigger than the sentence level. You sort of reach a point with sentences where it's like, I wanna know more than just why this sentence is happening by itself. You know, Any given sentence alone can, it can almost pique curiosity and it gets a little bit frustrating that you don't have more understanding of why would somebody say this? You know, why would there be this particular set of uh, characters put together into a sentence? And so you want to have more context. You want to have a story. You want to have an article that's like, you know, what do Chinese people think of uh, Hong Kong these days? And like, you know, things like that, that are interesting and, and grab your attention more. And so, you know, I think we'll probably focus more on that at the beginning and then you know just have everything else be kind of reference material do you want a sentence for this word and it's second usage well we have it but you don't have to you don't really even need to do that if you don't want to you could just uh use that if it happens to pique your curiosity and you want to go shopping for that word as you put it <laughs> yeah absolutely you know i think that's an interesting approach i think that you know the as i've gone through you know and started like you know making, you know, seeing the resources. You know, I found huge lists of like the first 10,000 trigrams, <laughs> most frequent trigrams and, you know, and these lists of idioms, you know, there's idiom and then there's colloquialism and they're not the same thing. Right. Uh, that you guys are just prime, especially with like your graded reading to start expanding into those idioms. Mm. And to, right, and to start expanding, more, yeah, I mean, uh, in that sense, definitely, you know, just the next layer of, of uh, the graded reading. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, like I said before, when I, I've, I've learned these characters, it made learning the, the bigrams really easy. And then while I'm doing that, they're also reinforcing the characters, and that's great. And then when, when I get to that stage where it's, I've learned the bigrams well enough, then listening to the sentences, you know, I'm, I'm picking out 
biograms all over the place. And that's mm -hmm. really handy. And, you know, you need to, you only have, you know, just over a thousand syllables, units of sound. But then when you get to the biograms, it just dramatically reduces. It's like, okay, yeah, there's only, you're not going to have 20 different meanings, distinct meanings for this biogram. And that pretty much right. narrows it down and, and, and nails it. Um, I am going to. I am going to say again. I was really fond of going over and taking a look at sentences that were below the level of the mm -hmm. Mandarin blueprint sentences. And you know, it may just be that I take smaller steps. You know, uh, on the website you have the whole sentence without a close, and that's great. And then you go to Anki and you have a close. I'm like, okay, that that was pretty tough. I want to go back to the website. Mm -hmm. and, but then I realized, well, there's more sentences on Anki than there are on the website. And, and it's like watching a detective show where you're like, did they set this up so that I have all the clues that I need to actually guess this word? Or am I really only going, you know, might I get lucky? Uh, so, but there's so many sentences focusing. I found on the red sentences first. That was, that, that would have been a great way for me to transition. But no, I, I opened them all up. I opened the whole can of worms up. And I yeah. got, I think for me, that, that was a little bit uh, confusing, but then I went down a notch. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it wasn't so much even the grammar that I, I really wanted. And I, and I did want a bit of grammar, not so much so that I could memorize it, but so that kind of like you guys mentioned it in your lessons, so that I could notice. It. Yeah. And, uh, and mostly it was because the sentences in those little tidbit grammar lessons were below the level of difficulty of even your website, no closed deletion sentences at all. Mm -hmm. They were like the most primitive forms of sentences. So I think that that was an important layer, even if, even if you don't want to mm, can it or label it as grammar, that that half step down because it makes me feel like I'm doing something. Woohoo, I'm racing through these characters. I really feel like I'm getting somewhere. And now, mm -hmm. woohoo, I'm racing through these biograms. I really feel like I'm getting somewhere with that level of sentence, kind of like the ones you send in your emails, actually. Mm -hmm. At that level, I'm like, woohoo, I love this email. I'm flying through these email Mandarin mm -hmm. sentences. Right, uh, right. And so for me, that was you know, a really important layer of challenge there. Uh, and a way to you know to start start bridging. Honestly, for this next month, uh, I really have, aside from an experiment or two, my main focus is really just going to be to just hit those sentences and those passages <clears throat> to bring in my vocabulary. More of the same, nothing nothing radical, no pun intended. Um, and uh, my my experiments, you know, I may. I, I'm, if, if they bear fruit, you know, I'm sure I'll, I'll probably uh, say something about them. Um, but at this point, yeah, sure, you know, uh, so what? I passed the HSK-4. That is not where your course and your material in. Yeah. You know, if you want to guarantee HSK-4, you're setting someone up well beyond HSK-4. That's I actually good to know. an intermediate course and yeah. passed this time. I just finished your intermediate character vocabulary in record time and you yeah, mentioned yeah. that on the website so yeah i should go back and a lot of stuff to look at but i uh, i want to um ask you more about that because um you know okay. you were moving through the characters at uh you know breakneck speed and it seemed like you were still having great recall and so that's something yeah. that you know i'm curious about uh if you could elaborate on that a bit more in the sense that you know and i think what was the the metrics on it for you like i think it was something like you finished the foundation course which was character 592 and you were finished the intermediate course characters which was character 1530 so you know mm -hmm. uh, almost a thousand characters in well, how what was the time frame there it ended up being somewhere into the 11th day you know and yeah. and that that was developing my process while while stumbling over myself and developing my process. Mm -hmm. By the end of that 11 days, and I wrote this in a comment, I said, uh, I, I will have spent about 80 hours figuring out how I could have done it in 50. 
<laughs> okay, yeah, sure. Okay, good. So moving with that idea, you know, I, I, I could have, knowing what I know now, I mm. could have done it faster. In fact, you know, today I actually had a wisdom tooth pull that felt great. And tomorrow, you know, I'm, I'm wanting to implant, you know, as early as possible. There's, there are about 300 additional characters moving from HSK4 to HSK5 that aren't included in your, your core set. Mm -hmm. And that's to be expected, of course. Uh, the biograms, you know, I've sorted out a different list. You know, you, you have well beyond, you have a lot of, you know, uh, biograms that are part of and are beyond or are not a part of HSK because yeah. it matches with your, uh, your starter, your starter kit. <laughs> yeah, we base it on starter. frequency. Yeah, we base it yeah. on frequency more than we base it on the HSK. So there's plenty of words that the HSK doesn't deem important, but they show up a lot. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think that was, that, that was really smart. And also it seems like you were also targeting to make sure that you, you had a wide and broad spread of all the actors in the scene. Sure. as well i think that was just excellent you know i think that was a just brilliant way to, to help a person build you know a really solid core tomorrow yeah. though i you know i'm going to try and see if i can get myself exposed to uh, and, and run through anki on all 300 of those characters for the hsk5 uh you know i wrote an article i said yeah my process write it down etc uh that's about two and two and a half, two to two and a half hours for a level of characters. Right now, I have so many anchor points, so much familiarity mm -hmm. with the characters themselves and their scenes that uh, I have a lot of tools to augment the Hansa movie method with, you might say. Okay. Not only do I have, you know, this actor in this setting and these props, but these props are great. I'm slowly pulling them closer and closer to the, their, their meaning in Mandarin, as mm -hmm. opposed to their, their meaning in, in my lollipop land. You know, I'm saying, <laughs> well, this is, what this is what those props are closer to me, some of them anyway. Right, I still right. have a lol lollipop land kind of you know, prop, prop ideas. But I'm yeah. slowly pulling that together. And the more and more I do that, the easier and easier it is. You know, a lot of my hands of scenes you know, have turned into like uh, just like two or three word reminders where I'm just naming each of the props in order, or I've made a story. You mm -hmm. know, there's a, a, I think it's third tone do, do, which is um, uh, alone. Okay. Right. Yeah. Good. And oh, yeah. the characters on there is like a side radical for a dog or a tuft of fur mm -hmm. on the left side. Uh, and then on the right side, there's, a, I think it's a chong for a bug. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I get to that character, you know, my story is, uh, if you look like a furry bug, you'll be alone. <laughs> yep. Then that gets Quick shortened breath. to fur, that, that becomes fur bug. Ah, yeah, sure. So these stories continue to contract and, you know, to get back to your original question, how, how, how is this working for me? It's because I'm letting these stories contract. It, it really is just because I'm starting out with, you know, a, a brief story, seeing what sticks, uh, making it making it more elaborate if I need to. But then all the ones that are already working, allowing those to contract all the way down to fur bug. Right. You know, and, and when I see fur bug or when I see the pinion for, for do or I see that meaning, I don't even need to visualize the full character anymore. Because in my mm -hmm. head, this is fur bug. And I'm 100% confident that I know the tuft of fur side radical and the bug character. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, by the time my, my hand would even start writing that, the rest of it's going to fill into my head. I don't need to have every character 100% in my mind's eye if I have these other links to it that, that will arrive at the same speed once I start writing. So there are some considerations like that. Uh, in test prep world, you know, like say with the SAT, that in order to save time to do some things, you start thinking of all kinds of very interesting things. Like one major practice is, uh, okay, don't, don't look at a question, find your answer, and then go to the bubble sheet and fill it in. No, instead, write down all your answers on for a whole page of questions, and then go to the bubble sheet and bubble all those answers in, and then flip the page and go to the next sheet of questions. 
Yeah. Why? Because it takes a little bit of extra time to go back and forth from the question booklet to your bubble sheet and then back and forth again. It, it's so significant an amount of time that keeps accumulating. Right. That you're like, well, we can shave off some time. Mm -hmm. if, right. And then you start discovering that, well, okay, not just the optimal character learning order or the similarity or clustering of these characters, but just the very fact that I, I, I saw them in so short a period of time when I'm initially reviewing them. You know, it's like, uh, if I see Huey, Dewey, and Louie right next to each other, and then I go to Anki and I see Huey, I'm already thinking Dewey and Louie. For a short period of time, just whatever characters are next to each other, yeah. No matter, almost no matter what order they were presented in, I, I naturally just, just in those first steps, I start to anticipate what the next character is. I don't need to remember that forever, not at all, but it helps me to, to get that first, you know, sort of implantation or in, initiation of that, that character into the Anki process. Mm -hmm. I've also talked about, uh, in some cases, mm, telling stories linked stories in the order that I'm looking at them on the levels. Uh, and it would be great, you know, if I thought if, maybe if, if we pulled up a, a level, you know, on the intermediate and just played around with it. But the basic idea is whatever that first character is that you look at, you then look at the next one, maybe they're in the same room and the actor from the first character turns <laughs> and says something to the actor in the second character. Right. Or maybe they were doing something, and then the next character continues doing that. You build a slightly larger story, and whatever it could be—just a cluster of two characters in a row, or five characters. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I remember—I think it was with um, uh, Xiang, which was to uh, like to turn around and look. Xiang right. four, mm -hmm. and then on, so that's that's Zena, the princess warrior. She's out in the backyard. Mm -hmm. outside fourth tone and she turns and looks around why because another character right next to it uh was uh xiang three xiang and it was just a mouth next to mm -hmm. the character for turnaround so xena was also on the inside of the house at the same time in the living room and she was making a sound that caused xena outside to <laughs> turn around and look and see what it was why? Yeah. Because on the inside, it traveled back in time, was playing a trick on herself. Yeah. And, and then Sean Connery was outside. <laughs> you know, then there was a Shung. And then on the inside, there was, you know, uh, Taong, uh, third, third tone, you know, and that was uh, Tom Hanks. And so now they're all part of this story. And then by the time I get to the fifth one, which is Tong, which was to go for a stroll, the end of the story was, and then we'll all go walk outside and go for a stroll. After you, know, after you had your fun. So doing that sort of thing, I happen to remember that that particular string of stories. But right. there's a lot of them that I've made and that I've just, I've forgotten, you know, thing, yeah. things have juggled and shuffled past it. Uh, and you, you know, you commented on that in previous uh, podcasts. And that's really all it is. It's just, you know, a, a, a lot of your advices, and Luke's advices on the course there's so many advices. It's it's easy to like you know try to simultaneously be acting on all of them. You right. know, if you're playing piano. It's like well, you must always be sitting up straight. You must always have your hands curved, just so and so whatever. But there's so many things that if you take another look at them and really kind of take them the extra mile, take them more seriously than they may that maybe even you intended them. They're really valuable. One of the things you say early on, you know, is talking about setting up a workspace. So you have, you know, your Anki open and you've got your, you know, your website open on your browser. So I'm like, okay, that's great. And I do that. And then all of a sudden, you know, I, I find out later on my workspace has become much more advanced than that. But because you actually just kind of, you know, mentioned the notion of, oh yeah, set up a workspace. That would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. Maybe <laughs> I wouldn't have set up anything if you hadn't, you know, started that idea. Right. Going back and looking at, you know, even the earliest lessons in pronunciation and taking a look at Anki and, and being like, oh, yeah, I already know those those basic tones. Yeah. It's, it's asking me, can I tell the difference between S and Z? Yeah, sure. I'm down. I'm good with that. You go back and take a look at that and see if there's any way you can leverage it. 
-hmm. So these, these, and then often you'll find that you can go back and leverage it. There's so many of those things, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you can tell people, but one thing you can't is, and here, here are all the umpteen million personal connections that you need to make. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't. You can try to set them up for it and set the stage, but at some point, a person does need to start making it their own, absolutely, if they're not already. And I think people can't help but do that with the Hanzo movie method, and that's great. And all I'm really saying here is, in addition to the Hanzo movie method, start considering how you can make some other things your own. Yeah, yeah. And I think that I loved that suggestion of kind of like taking the order a little bit and making connections even within the order. And you don't even necessarily have to do that. I don't think in the way that where it's like, okay, there happen to be related sounds, which does often happen because we put things related by components. So if it's the phonetic component, you'll have connections there. So that's good. But it could also just be, maybe it's the semantic component side of things. So like, this is just briefly, there's a set of five in level, what's going to be level 77, where we have the character for aluminum, the character for an inscribed motto, like a, a Zoyomi is a, is a company's like motto and they'll usually inscribe it in some way. And that's the character mean, which is basically name plus the metal component. And okay. then you have a nail and then tin. So we have this little quick aluminum inscribed motto, nail, tin. And I'm just like, I don't even need to have the hands of movie method thing together for me to associate these four characters. Cause just right off, like instantly I'm like, okay, we set up an aluminum foil, uh, you know, sort of thing to come up with a idea for where we, how we can nail in our inscribed motto, but we're going to replace that with, with tin afterwards, you know, like it's just something real quick to make a quick. And I mean, obviously that's, that's just a quick, you know, half baked idea, but that's sure. just semantic based, right? So it's those four are all in some way related to metal. And so even though they don't have any phonetic connection, therefore they would all take place in different sets. Uh, if you look at them individually, you could still use that semantic element. So that's a way that you could combine those two things. And that, you know, I hadn't really considered that before because, you know, of course I, despite making the order for the manuburn method i don't really I haven't gone through it in that way because you know i already knew all the characters before i made it so yeah it's a when you it's great, when great you game. mention two things half baked you know i don't first of all you know uh at, at this stage when you're designing the course yeah sure the example you give me it, it doesn't matter the fact is that uh sometimes you're students sometimes i'm half baked Oh yeah, well, it's way better than but zero. Your method, your method <laughs> will work even when I'm half baked, and right. I don't mean like you know high or anything. I mean just yeah. even if I'm not you know really mentally all there, and that's mm -hmm. great. That's what the term robust mm -hmm. means, you know. Yeah. Or like a, a poem or a book that has something, or a cartoon that has something for kids and adults, mm -hmm. you know. And that's really, I think, really yeah. you know, got to be a very interesting challenge because you know maybe no one person is going to notice everything that you noticed when you developed it, but you put so much into it, it helps to ensure that, uh, you know, pretty much everyone is going to have stuff that they're going to relate to. And, and that's good, you know, they don't, they don't need to uh, relate to it all. It's kind of like a poem. I, I may not really know what the author was referring to, but they made it relatable. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if, you know, this or that was uh, symbolic of something else. Right. It doesn't. Sure, I'm not getting every last scrap of the yeah. author's original intention out of it, but that is good storytelling. Mm -hmm. That is good, right? Communication, good art, etc. And you know, you guys have you guys have uh, supplied that. Uh, there was a second comment that had come to mind, and uh, I think it was, I don't remember. Oh gosh, I wish I did. It'll come back to me, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, just a comment on what you just said there, which is that the thing that's so um, excellent from our perspective is that we've sort of realized that all we need to do is provide the trigger and then a bunch of people are going to comment on it and give their responses to those triggers, which then in turn trigger other people towards their ideas. And like, that's why, you know, the Mandarin Blueprint method, one of the things that makes it robust is the people using it. It's not just us. I mean, like, obviously we set up a framework, but the way that people just get involved and say, here's my prompt for this. What about this scene? And you know, like they come up with now the living links that they're doing a lot in the, um, 
uh, phase oh, two yeah. and beyond is, is just, it's so cool because I know, for example, when we're coming up with new props in the upper intermediate and advanced course, that I just need to come up with like one prop and then people will come up with loads of others that I just need to be like, Hey, here's a general idea. Here's what it means. You know, here's the first thing that came sure. to mind for me, but what about you? You know? And so, yeah. Sometimes I just went with your prop. I didn't, I'd be like, sure, that's fine. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I'll go with that. Exactly. It's, that's yeah. fine. And sometimes it didn't, you know, I, uh, I really, there are different types of learners that orient to different things. So something that doesn't work for me, might work for another person. Personally, I, I, I try to avoid watching the videos and avoid other people's stories because I didn't, I thought that would confuse me as, as to what my own stories were. But I, I couldn't, like with the props, I couldn't help it. It's like, yeah, okay, that's memorable. I get it. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, I'd read someone else's example or something. But I did that. And for me personally, that's when I, I started to realize these stories, you know, they're great. And I came up with one or two really elaborate ones. And yeah, you know, like uh, for, uh, uh, I think it was song, uh, second tone. Uh, it's a very complex character, a lot going on in it. Mm -hmm. And I told myself a very elaborate story and I even wrote it out as a comment. And doing that, you know, like you said, there's 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 an aspect of kind of like the community process where my putting that out into the community mm -hmm. helped me. And I don't know if it helps anyone else. Uh, sure. I certainly my average my average you know uh, intention with a story is fur bug. <laughs> you know, if, I, if I can get it to that point, but the story that I have on on that character, you know, the comments that I make on intermediate, you know, it's like an essay. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just, you know, I'm only doing that for a few characters here. Right, right. Uh, so, yeah, writing things out on the forum itself, you know, gives me a feeling a little bit of self-consciousness. You know, like what I just wrote out, was that actually, you know, that's what made me go back and identify how I, I sort of misrepresented the, the varieties of Qing and Qing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, like, did I, I don't want to sound like I know it all or something. I better double check my business. And then I did. I'm like, oh crap. <laughs> Oops. And that helped me. Yeah. You know, just kind of getting that, I'll, I'll say putting putting a little skin in the game one way or another. Not all the time. Yeah. You can't engineer those emotionally serendipitous flash impressions that you know that all the time to remember each and every character. Mm -hmm. they're, they're just serendipitous. And from time to time you get lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right on about saying that uh, some kind of emotional orientation is even part of a more, you know, advanced kind of uh, aspect of the mnemonic technique, where if I get to a character and that reminds me of it's just even a subtle shift in emotionality. Mm -hmm. Here was a character, you know, uh, team for uh, surprise, you know, mm -hmm. or a startled. Um, and, you know, I had a character there before and then all of a sudden, the only the only mnemonic I need for that one right there is suddenly my heart skips a beat, so to speak, or you know, like someone said something, or the phone rang, or some noise happened. Doesn't matter. Whatever the feeling that a person gets when when they're startled, you know, this is, you know, that was enough. I'm like, oh, there's that there's that character, there's that boom, and it triggers everything. So realizing that, yeah, though all those things, there's so many different ways to go about. You know things and i think you know as a person uh realizes that that the hands of movie method i think is amazing for building that core yeah. you know time and time again i'm doing my cards i haven't seen one for a while i'm i'm not getting uh yeah. it doesn't come to me at first glance from sight reading it doesn't come to me in consideration of did i make a two or three word story for it and then finally, like, do I even have a hands of scene for this one? Mm -hmm. And I go back through and I finally rediscover it and I build it back up. I'm like, yeah, this is important because that, that was my go-to when these other, these other quick things fail. So making sure that you have a strong one for that core right now, I think is absolutely important. Yeah. And I think the takeaway I'm, you know, getting from this that I would want, I hope that other people who are, li you know, listening to this podcast will get out of it, especially if they're on the course, is that your initial instinct is often enough 
And sometimes the thing that you, that might seem too easy is okay. Like just a feeling, you know, just, oh, I startled. I know what that feels like. And I can just quickly associate that with the couple of components there. And then, you know, I, I can have a somewhat not totally full hands of movie method scene or just the very basics of it, just like a Kodak moment, quick thing, but that feeling alone, you know, mnemonics doesn't always have to be, um, you know, this brilliantly visual, super special effect based thing uh, that can help. It's like, it's, you know, almost like the, mo the most complex full of special effects scene that you can imagine should theoretically only be necessary when you keep forgetting for whatever reason, you know what that's I mean? Like, and so theoretically exactly. you can start from the simplest version and that's going to work a lot. It's going to work, you know, probably a, 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 the majority of the time. And then you just add little bits and just little bits if you need. And then, yeah, I find it fun sometimes. I just get into it and I'm just like, you know, and then there's waves crashing in and the violins come and, you know, does that, but that's just because I'm right. an artist and I like that stuff, you know, but yeah. It is fun. It's really cool. I think it helps to, yeah, bring out a bit of artistry too. And I think there's probably very similar to the, to, to the, the very process that natives go through as they're learning. Yeah. You know, the stories that they tell themselves and how they're relating and how they're, they're memorizing and learning those characters. You know, sure, they do some things by rote. Not, with, that, with that said, it, rather than writing the same character out hundreds of times, uh, going through Anki, yeah, you know, not much of a sacrifice at all. You know, I write them down a couple of times and then my, my rote learning, if anything, is Anki and I still engage it, but sometimes I will do like an extra custom session. Mm -hmm. So I'll mention that too, uh, by way of saying, how, how is my retention good? It's like, well, one of them is, uh, you know, in those two and a half hours, I'm managing to get six reviews and at least one writing of, uh, of every single character mm -hmm. and, and in, a, in a time uh, aware, in a very time conditioned sense. And another one too, is that my follow-up, is also like that. So what if tomorrow I have to go through 400, 500 cards? And so what if I'm if I'm on it? Then I'll follow that up with a custom study, mm -hmm. and and go through the same ones again. See if I can't cut my time down. I mean, my time right now, because I've been so engaged with the spreadsheet and Anki programming over the last week, has, I've just been kind of keeping it warm. Mm -hmm. But keeping it warm, my time is down to between about six and seven seconds per character. And my retention, uh, if I'm not pushing for speed, is darn near 100% right now. But yeah. I'm still wanting to push that down. I'm still yeah. wanting to, you know, find ways, you know, to, to get that faster and faster mm -hmm. uh, so that reading is faster, so that everything. Uh, I think I'd written a comment to the effect of, you know, there's a lot of processes going on neurologically and your brain can support oodles and oodles of process your Anki cards have a what is it a, a production and a what's the other one uh, comprehension. and a comprehension so those are two processes and you could do production or comprehension with or without english and pinion right next to each other yeah do english to character or pinion to character it would be difficult because then you'd have yeah. pinion that could go to the branch character. Might be a little tricky. <laughs> but at this, stage, see, at this stage, we're starting to see. At this stage, we're starting to see synonyms. At this stage, you know it, that that may be a good exercise to see mm -hmm. the English and be like, "Oh man, I've got to think of both Hansa or all three Hansa." Yeah. Oh my gosh! But really, that's not a bad thing. You know, there's also, you know, in, in addition to the different types of cards in these processes and their reversals, there are other aspects of just seeing like a character maybe, and then knowing its tone and not knowing the English whatsoever or even the meaning. And that's a certain kind of process. Is it, is it a good one to really train? I don't know. <laughs> but noticing that that is, you know, inextricable part of, of, of the entire process, it's like, would it be better in my mind if I saw the character, knew the sound, and then knew the English, and then knew the meaning? Or maybe I could know the sound last instead of second? Where does that, you know? So I, I wrote a comment to the effect of I've isolated about 16 processes that I'm identifying with. I could extend that a little bit more. So my experiment has to do with, 
isolating those processes mm -hmm. and seeing what I what I experienced as a result of you know practicing those processes separately. Yeah. Um, so I'm really curious about how those things turned out. You know, I'm learning. That's why I'm learning the spreadsheets and the Anki, so that I can mass manufacture these experiments. Sure. Sure. Yeah, no, that's a great way to do it because you always want to try to, you know, any way that you can make something more efficient because you realize an extra thing you were doing wasn't actually necessary. Or even if it was necessary at a certain point, if you can manage to drop it as a uh, an aid to your learning, then you'll strengthen another part of the uh, experience. And then eventually, you know, you should get strong enough like a muscle you don't need, you don't need it. Yeah. And then next thing you know, you're, you're good to go. So yeah, that's... It's great stuff. You know, we're always trying to find, you always try to find that balance, right? You know, between giving yourself clues and then, you know, giving yourself sort of like the extra intellectual weight you have to carry, which makes you stronger. So it's, yeah, that's a, that's a good thing, right. set of things to experiment with. Good. That's yeah, awesome. A lot of things to balance, you know, having a good time while, <laughs> right? Yeah. while you're balancing these other things or, you know, coming up with, uh, beautiful ideas or uh, or appreciations of beauty oh you've got these characters and it's neat to see them in block print but if you write them or you see different fonts there's an artistry to it the character is written slightly different depending upon what it's adjacent to or depending upon what components are in it you may see that the components are drawn slightly different so as to fit with each other when you hear the tones it's almost like listening to people speak Hansa strokes they're they're not speaking individual Hansa strokes, but they're they're you know the very intonation of the language is like strokes, in a way. Yeah, no, if, I know what you mean. If that if that right, you know, if, if that if that works for you, you know, or if not, and every single sentence then is like its own unique. <laughs> every single possible, and you can't memorize them all. No, it's it's mm -hmm. you know, like I say, beautiful things are beautiful because they're temporary. Maybe that's the only time you'll ever hear that sentence, but seeing it played out seeing it perform you know it's very neat yeah. uh so yeah for me mostly this next month is about trying to shoot not just to the hsk5 oh and i wanted to add you mentioned maybe it took you four months i have one advantage that you didn't have i have your method <laughs> you did not have right. when you went through that process sure. or at least so i would suspect so you know it's kind of a standing on shoulders of giants kind of a situation uh, in that right. sense. Right. Right. Well, as we did, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. No. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's a good point. Luke sometimes makes that point. He's like, you know, we, we kind of are making this because it's what we wish we had, you know, uh, when we yeah. were doing it. So it's like, that's part of, that's been a big part of the motivation to begin with. I mean, if this already existed, and then we would have been like, all right, great. You know, maybe we can improve upon, you know, what we had made, but like, we, we just felt that there was, you know, any, uh, not that we only were business focused on this because at the time we were students. So, but like, so we were largely frustrated with the educational system, but like any business, the reason it should come into existence to begin with is you look at what's currently available and you go, wait, this, I can see how this is missing some major elements uh, to, to, you know, I don't know, I saw, somebody sees a, a computer keyboard and they go, well, wait a second, if you just had it like this, it would be so much better. And it's a gap in the market. So, you know, we, that's kind of where we were at with it. We were like, this could be improved upon in about 10 different ways. And so let's get. Absolutely. And honestly, I think that without too much stretch of the imagination at all, that your system could be adopted in order to teach natives their own language. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Kids going, native kids going through their school system might be, you know, already, you know, you've got simplified, already you've got pinyin being introduced into the public schools there. You've mm -hmm. got the, what is it, the draw in or the Bopomofo characters, yep. you know, kind of leveraging a bit of phonetics there. I don't think it's beyond, you know, maybe you guys have thought about this, I, you know, or not. Your system might, might be better to teach Mandarin some Mandarin speakers <laughs> in some ways. Well, well, I don't know. There, there are some aspects to the memory system. Maybe a five-year-old doesn't have an inventory of 55 characters in 13 settings, but still there's some other things, you know, oh, yeah. uh, I think uh, to, to be had there and fun to be had there uh, yeah. for the kids. So, 
you know, that's another reason why I'm really excited for what you guys have done. I think it's what you call kind of a, well, I don't, I don't know how hidden the gem it is because I still see your uh, advertisements pop up and I feel bad because I'm like, oh, you're paying to advertise to me, but I already, already bought your system. <laughs> well, that's terrible. Yeah. I wonder if you can filter that out. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a, probably we should be able to, but you know, it's a uh, Facebook advertising, <laughs> advertising. It is, it is a very tricky sea to navigate. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so, uh, I don't doubt it. I'm barely familiar with like the, like the fa Facebook algos for doing that sort of thing and I, don't, I wouldn't know how to control that on the facebook ads yeah yeah it's it's, um, it's a you know a challenge but hey you know we still we I, we get to do an online business so it's uh, at the end of the day it's all worth it <laughs> so i i have a quite well that's great i have a question for you and i i popped the same question on luke and luke kind of looked at me just like i oh, you know you're looking for some kind of a hack but really all i can recommend is one of what I've what we've already told you to do and just do like more listening to sentences and things mm -hmm. like that. But knowing a little bit more perhaps about how I'm approaching this and maybe how my mind works and how you, you relate to that or what we might have in common. Mm -hmm. uh, during this this coming month, I'm at I'm at three months now and I feel great about it. You know, I talked to Luke and he said, fluency? You may be working all the time, like I am. You're going to see fluency maybe four to six months. Mm -hmm. uh, literacy? Yeah, I said, oh, yeah, after two months, I, I'm sure it, it, at a first grade level of literacy. And that is that has improved quite a bit. I think maybe mm -hmm. I'm now in the third grade, mm -hmm. uh, literacy-wise. And I'm recognizing, you know, lots of stuff. Uh, it, and I'm trying lots of different media. Movies too hard. I just, I celebrated my birthday and I bought a couple of $5 uh, Mandarin language, like Mandarin video games in Mandarin, some, some for learning Mandarin and some kind of not for learning Mandarin, you know, maybe they're like just novels or something where, or, or uh, like, uh, it, like text adventure kind of things, you know, where you see scenes and there's dialogue and you engage the dialogue. Yeah. Uh, so I'm doing these things and I realize, okay, yeah, I am noticing a lot of what's going on there because that's comprehensive. You know, but when it comes to using this month more productively to try and to say, and now maybe I have a first grade level of fluency. Mm -hmm. Now maybe I'm just just a hair's breadth past the Turing test, a hair's breadth past the Chinese uh, the Chinese room scenario. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm looking to tease out. So that's what I'm asking you now, you have any recommendations, you think, or maybe the wisest thing is just to kind of reiterate what you put out in the blueprint. What do you think? Well, I think that if you're looking to get to a fluency state, you have to start speaking and or writing. You know, in your case, you might enjoy the writing part of it as well, but since you're so interested in like the written part of the language, but you know, both really, you gotta output. And so the best thing to do, I would say, is to start talking to some teachers on italki. Perhaps maybe you can find somebody nearby to where you live who's willing to meet up with you. And the reason for this is that it helps improve a lot of things. You know, it helps improve your your uh, fluency because you're actually trying to activate the passive vocabulary you've been building up. But also, um, when you're in a conversation with somebody, there's these sort of in the same in the same way as when you're playing a video game and you must get past a certain a point in order to move to the next level. And so that gives you this sort of artificial motivation. When you're in a conversation with somebody, you kind of, I don't know, your brain just rises to the occasion a lot of the time. And it just goes like, okay, I, I want to convey my meaning to this person. And I want to understand what they're saying for, you know, just because it's, we've decided to talk now. And so there's a, a sense of urgency to it because you don't want to keep somebody waiting forever to come up with an answer. So um, I think that getting into some conversations is going to be one of the best things you can do to get towards fluency. Yeah, I was afraid you'd say that, but yeah, I, I, I got a tutor I can work with off of Fiverr for now, and then my girlfriend in Taiwan, who, you know, it, it, one of her friends said, the last person who's going to help you learn the language is your girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> so this is to switch to English and chat with you. Uh, yeah. In and addition to that, I, get a girlfriend I am, after you've already learned some speaking, then it can really help. Yeah. But if you already have 
a, a girlfriend, you've already established a relationship speaking English. Right. That's tough because she's like, well, why would I, you know? But yeah. Exactly. She does help a little bit, but it's, you know, it's definitely not like a dedicated tutoring session. Uh, right. I think having fun with the Google Translate, just seeing if it translates what I'm trying to say into what I actually, into some form of what I actually meant to say, mm -hmm. that's great. Sure. Uh, you know, and using the Google Translate, I will also, uh, I will translate it both ways. I'll write something in English, see what it comes out with in the Mandarin, and then I'll reverse it. Often when you reverse it, you just hit the back and forth arrows and it'll switch sides. Mm -hmm. I wrote it in English and, and then it translated to Mandarin, but then I switch fields so that, or a copy and paste so that it, that looks like the Mandarin that I put in first and it will translate it to English. And it's amazing. Often there will be a radical change mm -hmm. when you do that in Google yeah. Translate. Yeah. When you, when you go back and forth like that and you have to do it, you know, sometimes two or three times and say you land on a very stable back and forth interpretation, reinterpretation of, of what was being said. But also just in terms of picking up what I'm saying at all, yeah. good grammar or not. So that's the speaking and production end of things. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'll just stick with those things. Also, what about the, the a, listening aspect of things? Yeah. yeah. Well, let me just say this first before I get into the listening element. There's also a thing you can do, which is like a thing that my teachers had me do at university, which is kind of, you know, it's a little bit... Um, it sometimes struck me as a little bit academic at the time, but it does have a benefit, which is like, just take a word and just write a sentence with that word or take a few words and write a little story with that word and try to apply some emotion to it. Like, so like, see if you can um, write a sentence where that's the only word that could work, right? Like, so, so that, it, it, it signifies mastery of the concept. You know, so it's like, if you can write a paragraph or a word that is um, in, in a sentence that makes it very clear that like, this is, the, I mean, it doesn't have to be like, literally, this is the only possible word you could use, but like something yeah. where it's like, that's, if you wrote a closed delete sentence, it would be a good closed delete sentence. Think of it like that, you know, if you deleted one of the characters of the two. Well, I, I, get, I get the gist of what you're saying, and I, I can work with that, most importantly. Mm -hmm. I can work with that, and I understand immediately several benefits that yeah. could come from that. Bit by bit, you're, you're really making more and more solid at this, at, at this level, at least one character at a time. Mm -hmm. You know, from time to time, maybe I didn't know a character so well, but I finally saw it in a biogram and boom, that solidified it. Or I used it in a sentence and that solidified it. You know, at this point, a lot of, a lot of what, what's happening is you just, okay, good. Now you're just solidifying what, you know, you had a tenuous grasp on it. Now you have a firm grasp on it. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. Sometimes the learning doesn't mean learning more. It just means solidifying. <laughs> it just means finish chewing what you already put in your mouth kind of a thing. Yeah. Finish digesting that. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. So I, those are some good ideas. And then uh, I don't know how much longer you want to go out, but on the listening side of things, anything do you think in addition to working on those sentences and those are coming around better and better, you know, I can teach mm -hmm. you to look at them interpret them, try the closed deletions for heaven's sakes, even go back onto the website and read them without, you know, because I didn't really do that when first going through. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, just listening to the streams of them at regular speed or a reduced speed. Uh, and then the, your passages, you've got a lot there. And I'm, yeah. I'm really going to be hitting that thick this month. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Do you think anything else really pop out at you in terms of listening? Because right now a lot of the media is, is too advanced and I, that's too right. much. So anything in between right. maybe the sentences and actually listening to, you know, mm -hmm. cartoons and movies? Sure, sure. Yeah, well, certainly, um, yeah, I mean, cartoons and movies are great because you get a lot of visual context that can help you figure something out, even if you don't totally understand it. Um, but there's, you know, there's, it's these gradations of what's helpful and, you know, so right. listening to something in the background that is advanced is not nothing, right? It's definitely something to have on, you know, having something in the background that's, play, that's playing Chinese improves your listening comprehension at like a meta level because you just get used to hearing Chinese. So, yeah. I mean, it's the least helpful in a focused way, but because you can always have it on, you're getting a yeah. little bit of help you know, all the time. So it's kind you're of- training your ear, maybe not your comprehension, but now all of a sudden, right. It, 
your ear is right. hearing less fuzzy, more distinct. Right. So that's one uh, side of it. You're doing a lot. Sorry, go on. No, that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like phonation so was the last word. I think I may have made that word up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so then you have okay, so you you then you have something like the listening that's on all the time that is from our sentences. So like, or the um, longer form stories. So we provide the audio for all that stuff. So in the review lessons, we have all like a zip file that has all of the sentences. And then, got them. <laughs> what's that? You do I got them all in their own folders on my phone Great. and on the computer. That is definitely my next step is <laughs> to just, is, is to be hitting those hard. Yeah. So that I can listen to that stuff in context as opposed to like you pointed out, you know, oh, the dog is blue. Hey, that octopus is wild. Or, yeah, you know, yeah. well, yeah. you made a something to that effect, like a yeah. So yeah, go ahead. having the context. So yeah, you have the the phase four stories, you got the phase five stories, and then very soon we're gonna have the intermediate course stories as well. And uh, then of course all the sentences. So you, if you have that stuff on, um, you know, there's a higher likelihood that you'll be able to comprehend it. So like there's having that on in the background is great. And so again, it's like the Katsumoto thing is try not to ever have your ears open and not have Chinese coming into them, you know, in some Don't way. turn it off, turn it down. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you okay. know, that can be very, uh, you know, intimidating, but on the other hand, like it's not actually that hard. It's mostly just psychologically difficult to get over that hurdle. Um, and Sometimes so, if I'm yeah. trying to sleep, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, uh, sleep, it, that's not even proven that that helps. It's just people speculate that it helps, but we don't really know. So like that's, if you don't want to do it when you're sleeping, that seems a reasonable <laughs> line to draw. I, I'm not against trying it, but yeah, definitely. Because if it hurts your sleep, sleep quality right. it's not going to help you you know what i mean like so so yeah um but so then there's that then again i'll reiterate the point about getting into conversations with people because it raises the stakes and you feel like i really want to understand what you're saying and so the fact that you know you are in a conversation and you're hearing the back and forth each again i, I feel like your brain rises to the occasion and you know yeah. tries to understand it more so because there's just lower stakes when it's just a recording playing in the background now it's definitely working subconsciously and all of that especially if it's coming from the course and you've seen the sentences or the paragraphs before um mm -hmm. but when you actually get into conversation with somebody that can be very helpful for your listening comprehension. So, you know, that suite of things. And like you said, you know, watching TV shows and movies and cartoons that give you that extra visual, those extra visual cues can really help. Um, the cartoons, but, that's a yeah. little bit too much, but yeah, at least it helps with that, that audio parsing. This mm -hmm. reminds me too. So there's actually obviously plenty of stuff, more than enough for a month. <laughs> Hell yeah. it, you know, no matter how intense I go at it. Uh, I think her name is Anne. Left one a video in response to one of your podcasts very recently. Mm. She's interacting with her tutor, and that's like an hour long video. And I watched it for ten minutes, but I think I should go back actually and put myself more in Anne's shoes, and maybe put myself in the tutor's shoes because they're both speaking intelligently, mm -hmm. and they're both you know, and they're both listening. And I think. You know that that could be something for me to do too. I'm glad that you asked about that. And uh, when I get to talking to a tutor, I'll record it. Hopefully, yeah. maybe you know, some more students might post it. But for now, that hour with Ann, so to speak, mm -hmm. I'm gonna that probably be actually good to really actually pay significant attention to and put yeah. myself in Ann's shoes and just see how much she's struggling, how much I'd be struggling too. Yeah. You know, I'm you know. Uh, maybe I can like sort of empathy struggle with her mm -hmm. and, and not, not just, you know, empathize, but also like, can I even do that? <laughs> you know, the level that Anne's at right yeah. now, that takes a lot of stamina. So, mm -hmm. um, okay. So I, I just had another, uh, another that, point I yeah. that too, which is that um, practicing your pronunciation and therefore shadowing, you know, which I'm sure you know about and people we've talked at Nauseam about shadowing. I do love shadowing. I got all yeah. kinds of weird stuff I do with that. Yeah. I think that that helps with listening comprehension because if you, and again, practicing speaking and doing it. Look, the problem with practicing speaking at the beginning is that we kind of sound 
like idiots. It's just, you can't help it. Like you, you haven't developed the muscles well enough and it's just, you end up saying pronunciations a little bit wrong. You even know it's happening as it's going on. It's just not a very comfortable thing. So you kind of have to, to some degree, muscle through it. But when you get your syllables, you know, really good standard Mandarin, like, and you're saying it properly, then I think that there's a connection between that and hearing other people making those sounds. I, I can't. Absolutely. And I'll tell you what it is. Bill. I'll tell you what it is. It's when you become a craftsman, you notice other craftsmen. Right. If you put some time in and you learn how to embroider or make leather craft or whatever, all yeah, of a sudden yeah. you notice other people's work. And that's what you're doing. You're just crafting a sentence, and then all of a sudden, boom, you notice the other craftsman. There's mm -hmm. a lot more depth. I yeah. think that's all that's going on right there. Exactly. Exactly. You know, when somebody's like, I'm having trouble differentiating between tium and tium. And I'm like, yeah, it does. I, if I think about it intellectually, those two sound very similar. But on the other hand, once I've actually like really worked them out myself, said loads of words with both of those sounds, and then heard other people speaking them. To me now, like, you know, unless somebody's speaking a dialect and they've, their dialect is a little bit different, I'm not going to ever have that trouble. But it took me kind of going through and making sure that I'm distinguishing between those sounds. And so that I, my overall point is focusing on improving your pronunciation at a granular level can actually help with listening comprehension, despite the Absolutely. fact that it seem like the same thing, but yeah. No, no, it's, 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 I think it makes a ton of sense. You know, there's a study done on like IQ tests and if all you did was to review definitions of words with people before an IQ test, mm -hmm. the measured IQ average shoots up like 20 to 30 points. Oh, wow. Because people are now clear on actually what these words mean, but otherwise they take this IQ test and they're kind of fuzzy and ambiguous about a lot of words. Like just clear up the definitions of the words, just clear up that pronunciation. Because each and every time, you know, there Nobel Prize, no, yeah, Nobel Prize was awarded for the person who really, you know, uh, discovered what we call now mirror neurons. It's a real thing. I thought it was pseudo science at first, but no, it's a real thing. You see a football player throw the football, you know, there's a whole strata of nerves in your own body that kind of makes your arm want to throw that football too, and it's it's just kind of sub threshold level. It, it gets kind of warmed up. Yeah. And when you see other people speaking or moving around, those mirror neurons kind of kind of make you sub threshold kind of want to move around or imitate them. And when you hear something, you know, again, mirror neurons are firing. But if you're if you're if you're repressing that uh, activity, then you know you're you're repressing what it is to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, kids, you know, echolalia is just you know repeating what other people are saying without even thinking. It's kind of like what the shadowing is, just, you know, so let's just do, this, just do some echolalia here. And then once you're training that in a little bit more and more and you're not repressing it, you're not worried about it, then when you're listening more and more and more, that sub-vocalization is, is firing off more and more and more. Those mirror mm -hmm. neurons operate, you know, in, in sort of a, a, a gradient extending, you might say, from uh, the subconscious through to the consciousness. You, you don't really know when you're not conscious that so many things are, your brain is still processing them. But yeah, obviously it is still processing lots of stuff that you're not conscious of. Uh, yeah. Maybe like machine code rather than what you see on the screen, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that, yeah, it, you, you wanna foster that when you practice speaking or you practice shadowing because then everything you listen to, you know, you've got a clear definition or you've got a clear sound in your head. And now instead of shadowing with a garbled sound, you're shadowing with a clear one. You've refined the definition, so to speak, of that sound. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No. Long, cool. story. long story long. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, a, that's no problem. Well, I think that that's a decent enough place to uh, finish up for today. But um, Thank you so much for taking the time to chat through your experiences with this. You know, I, then we should probably do this uh, every now and then because you're going on this this journey right now. It's very interesting, and so you know, maybe we can check in with you again in a month and see how your experiments are working out. But uh, uh, I'd love to. Yeah, the experiments are a lot of fun. You know, I put really a lot of a lot of a lot of time into them. So uh, I'm really curious to see how if they flop or if if you know if I if I make a a discovery mm -hmm. uh, or whatever it is and so yeah let's let's uh let's let's make that uh 
one month, if, if not sooner, sounds perfectly fine with me. Absolutely. Love it. Excellent. Well, thanks to Keith Travis today for joining us. And we'll be uh, back again with the normal podcast and other case studies. And of course, if anybody wants to learn <laughs> anything more, we'll, to we'll do uh, just head over to mandarinblueprint.com. And uh, thanks again, Keith. Thank you. Have a, have a wonderful, uh, have a wonderful day.